Awesome. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the correct time to be at church. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming to Willow Grove Bible Church. In case we haven't met before, my name is Jason and I'm the pastor here. Uh, we have an amazing worship team up behind us uh, and so glad that we have a, a new guest. It was Nate Swartz. Nate Swartz. Nate, thanks for joining us today and being a part of this. Um, we have a special day today. Jim Snyder from Caster Cares is with us. We're going to interview him as a part of our Beyond Sunday series. Again, we're talking through how can we put feet and arms and energy and motion into a lot of the stuff that we've been studying over the past couple of months. So uh, before we get into it, though, would you please join me in a word of prayer to start our service off? Lord, thanks for times to be together. Thanks for congregations. Thank you for buildings to meet in and people to get excited about seeing and giving hugs to and hearing about what you've been doing in their lives. Lord, thank you for what you did yesterday in Kensington, what you have been doing, what you continue to do. Thank you for using us in the process of showing love and care. So Lord, please bless us today as we, as we meet and we gather around your throne. Meet us in a, in a real way. Allow us to do something that would push us to live a Christian life beyond just Sunday. It's in your name we pray all of these things. Amen. I announced a little bit earlier, but if anybody wants to play an instrument, we have uh, tambourines and a cajon and whatever, so feel free to go back. Um, just be mindful of the tempos of the songs. <laughs> Some are more rhythmically um, encouraging than others, so feel free. All right, Larry's got the tambourine. Okay, Larry. <laughs> okay. Um, let's stand together and worship. And uh, we're going to start with Lift High the Name of Jesus. And that's what we're here to do in Jesus' name today. Also, we're going to just sing, we're going to sing that one twice. And we're going to skip the next song. So, but just hang on for the ride. And I would encourage, um, if you know the chorus, or when you're beginning to learn the chorus of this song, drop your paper and clap along or lift your hands to Jesus. Lift your hands to 
we can dismiss any of the folks who would like to be in the nursery at this time. Um, yeah, if there are folks. Um, and that's open to anybody. Um, guests certainly welcome. Um, the other thing um, is open to any uh, testimony, prayer requests. Uh, I know Cast Your Cares happened yesterday. I didn't know if there were any. We saw some pretty snazzy pictures online. It looked like it went really well. I didn't know if anybody had any testimony from that um, or any other testimony. A couple uh, prayer requests I know that I've had on my mind this past week is still praying for Julie and her friend and their family, for the deaths in their family, uh, and also Meg and her sister Oni for, for health and for healing. Praise the Lord, Meg is here. Yeah, yeah, Meg is back. Thank you, Meg, for your service, the sound. Other folks? Yes, yeah, Cynthia? I'm sure getting really cold does not really help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Bob. Yeah. Thank you. Nancy and her upcoming procedure. Anybody else? Yes, Cynthia? I'll share about Ken mentioned yesterday. We actually, big thing, we have leftovers. <laughs> so anybody after service who wants some leftovers, there's not in the refrigerator. Um, but we did have a good group who were able to serve, and that time to be able to sit and talk with people who were down there. Thank you for everybody that helped provide the best. That is a thanks to everyone that uh, supplied the food, made it. everything I can uh, start prayer here um, father uh, we come before you um, wanting to recognize that you are our redeemer sanctifier healer and coming king all four of those things and you want to be the each of those things uniquely to each of us um, in every um, pain point and in every every joyful event uh, that we reflect on from this past week. Um, we thank you for the conversations and the relationships and the time spent together um, in ministry with Cast Your Cares and, and the group of folks who serve together. I thank you for our ongoing relationship there and I pray for continued blessing and opportunities in that space. And each time we go down, and I thank you for the energy um, that you've given to people coordinating and to everybody who's donated items uh, to share there in a meal. There's something really um, holy in a space of coming together and eating at a table where everybody is welcome. And it doesn't matter um, background or position in life. Um, thank you for um, the way you've continued to provide for us um, and we ask for your, um, like I said, you want to be healer for us. And so we, we ask that you would cause us to expand our image and our idea of you and what healer means to us. Um, I thank you for um, the way that you've walked with Meg and her sister. And we just pray for complete healing and continued presence. Um, and divine new knowledge and new understanding for treatment um, and that things would come into alignment with how you you would have that um, i pray for doctors and for nurses and for other staff that are treating both of them um, 
and also for Julie's friend and their family um, as they experience um, loss and grief um, and feeling like um, maybe you're, you're very distant. And so I pray that they would know that you're close in a new way um, and that walking through, through darkness on a journey with you um, can feel like it's all, all over the place, but you, you never leave and, and you're there um, even when we don't see it or recognize it. Um, and I, I pray for Cynthia and healing in her neck. Um, I pray that that would um, just resolve quickly and that um, the temperatures um, affecting that or making it feel worse um, would just calm and just heal. Um, and also for, for Nancy, ongoing, ongoing health um, and having a procedure come up this week where there might be anxiety and worry. Um, and again, just um, calm around anxiety and, and knowing that you, you're in control of um, the outcome and you're in the space of the procedure and, and acknowledging your presence in that space, even though it might be stressful. Um, again, I, I pray that you would just cause us to continue to expand the idea of who you are and who you want to be for us in each of these ways. Um, and I ask that we would have open eyes and ears and, and hearts to what we were to receive from you this morning. Amen. Good morning, everybody, again. Hey, Nick. Good to see you. Um, our theme for the month has been this idea of Beyond Sunday. Not that we want to put the church in our rearview mirror and drive away, but we all do literally put the church in our physical rearview mirrors, unless you're Bob and Kim and walk over. But <laughs> we do. We put it in our rearview mirrors, and we drive away from church every Sunday. Everybody does it. The question that Jesus would have for us, right, is now what are you going to do, <laughs> right? For so many in this world, coming here to this space on a Sunday throughout history has been the ultimate experience in religion and Christianity. Jesus comes, breaks that, cuts it in half and said, if this is all you're living for, well, then I feel, I feel sorry for you. There's so much more. There's so much more. This Christian life is about living beyond the Sunday morning. Anybody can do this. Anybody can walk into this space and nod the heads when they need to and stand and sit when they want to. I've been leaving here. That's where Jesus would say, that's where I want to live with you. So when we do beyond Sunday, uh, there's obvious connections of some things that we have possible and opportunities to do. Some of them are more adult in nature. Not all of them are student-focused because we're, you know, trying to launch something student-minded here shortly. But we do have an opportunity for students to live beyond Sunday. And Elise is going to come up and share about an opportunity that's coming up that anybody, teenagers are down, uh, come on up Elise, could do. And they could engage the beyond Sunday mentality, okay? All right, Elise. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Miss Julie wanted me to remind everyone that we have um, a shoebox packing party for Operation Christmas Child on Sunday, November 21st after the morning service. And you can help to participate by um, purchasing items for the children, donating money to cover the shipping costs, or by helping to pack the shoeboxes um, on November 21st. And there are uh, papers in the back of the sanctuary listing items that can be purchased, as well as um, information about our gift regis uh, registry at Target for those who would like to order online. And there is more information about the ministry of Operation Christmas Child through Samaritan's Purse. And we hope that everyone will join us for another year of this special ministry. And pizza. And pizza after. <laughs> Okay, so those are boxes that are going to be packed and they're going to be shipped out of our country and they're going to go into other various areas of this world and someone's going to open that up and they're going to experience a Beyond Sunday happening. Cynthia. Um, just a comment. Julie did order boxes from Operation Christmas Child. Cool. 
So next week and on the 21st, we'll be assembling those boxes. Oh, awesome. Pull them up. So we don't need shoe boxes to wrap. Okay, so don't bring shoe boxes. Okay, cool. So engage in that, right? I mean, no matter what age, but especially if you're a student or a young person and you're saying, man, I'm not sure I can live beyond Sunday. I don't drive anywhere. I don't have a job. But this is something you can engage in to, to be in that same mentality. We got to beyond Sunday, right? Because we had seven months of kind of learning and understanding and, and kind of digging into those aspects of what it is like to be a Christian. We talked about the engaging questions that Jesus asked and moved from there into a series of faith-filled risks. What did that look like for the disciples? What does that look like for us now? From there, we went into called ones and sent ones series, in which we talked about how we're called into Christ, not called to go do something. Right? It's a very different thing. Some people say, well, I'm called to be a so-and-so. I'm called to be a teacher. I'm called to be a doctor. I'm called to be a janitor, right? No, you're called into Christ. That's where your calling is always and every time. And then when you're there, he sends you. And then you're sent to go do something on his behalf or are in his will, not your will. That's where the sent ones came from. And then we went into a series of costly discipleship. You know, you can have a discipleship process with Christ that is not very costly. I mean, if, you're, if your margin of error is I go to church on Sunday and I try to be nice to people, you know, that is a bit of the discipleship of Christ, but it's not costing you very much. We look at the disciples and their discipleship was costly left families, left identities, stood on water when it shouldn't have been physically possible, fed 5,000 people out of five loaves of bread, two fish, all these things that they went into that we think now, wow, what great stories. Imagine being the one who was told, you gotta walk on water, or you're being the one that's told, well, we're gonna, we're gonna somehow feed 5,000 people with this, and you have to put it out there faithfully and say that this guy is telling us this is not crazy. There's cost to that, cost of their livelihood, their own empowerment, their own will and direction. And then, of course, we went to discourse, which was we know that Jesus loves to engage, loves to talk, loves to chat, loves to relate. My mom came home from um, her time at Castor Cares just all excited and, and, and felt a, a rewarding experience. And you know why? Because she got to sit down and have discourse with people and engage conversations and get into that space. We have to understand that Jesus, yes, does want us to feed people, right? We're going to talk about that in a second. But he also wants us to relate and get in with them and be where they are. That's what he did. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had to have come here for 30-some years. He could have just done anything he wanted to do from out in the galaxies. But he came here because he wants to be with us. And he wants us to do likewise. And then love is. We went through 1 Corinthians 13 and kind of broke that down, took it away from the weddings of the world and put it into the realness of our life. Are we truly loving? Are we always patient, always kind, never self-seeking, slow to anger? Which brought us then to the space where I felt like it was time to be a little manipulative. To take all the stuff that we've been learning and nodding our heads and me too, like all in this space, and now we gotta so what? Do something about it. That's where this comes from, beyond Sunday. So what? So what we learned all this stuff? So what we sat underneath the teaching and said, yes, I agree, and man, this is really pushing me into different spaces of my thinking or different spaces of my soul. Okay, so what? Now we get to see what people are doing beyond Sunday. We had these as our kind of reckoning verses. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus says in John 14, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Just the sheer multitude and the, and the exponential growth of the church allowed us to do more than he could do. But look at what he wants us. He wants us to do what he had been doing. He told the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount as it was closing. And by the way, after all those things, right? Blessed are the meek, the kind, those that are... are, are, are Chastise for my name. Remember this, that in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds. And glorify your good deeds. No. And glorify the Father. As good as what everybody did at Kensington last night was, if it did not glorify the Father, we're falling short of this call. Just like there's this component of agape love that we can't tap into under our own human strengths and abilities. We need the, the love of Jesus Christ in us, right? We need the redemptive work of Christ in us, the sanctification of the role of the Spirit in us to allow us to agape love. 
The same thing is true. When we go out and we do good deeds, it's so hard for any one of us to dissociate ourselves from our good deeds. It's a challenge in this world. We want to we want to feel the rewarding of what we did and feel proud of ourselves and, and feel like, wow, I'm so glad I did that. I learned so much about myself. But we have to consistently as Christians come back to this, that there's a clause at the end of our good deeds. Did it bring glory to the Father? Or did it just make you feel good about yourself? Or did it make just me feel good about myself when I come here on Sunday mornings and do this? Is it glorifying the Father or is it glorifying me? Now the reason I bring all this up before I get to talk with Jim is because I have a feeling that Jim has already encountered these kind of thoughts along his journey and has been living this tension uh, for the last however many years that he has been living with his family in Kensington. This is nothing new to him. But for those of us that are now in that so what beyond Sunday movement and we're going out there, these are some things that we have to be prepared for. That our good deeds are good only in and of themselves. But with Christ, when we go out, the good deed transforms in front of other people and brings witness and understanding and the magnitude of the Holy Father right in front of all of it. That's our call. Before I bring Jim up, let me just set the tone with Matthew 25 because I think what I see in this world now and probably what Jim and his family and those that are involved in his ministry see often is something that's significantly embedded within Matthew 25. And I actually hadn't really seen it that much until recently. Let's just review in Matthew 25. Jesus is actually talking a lot about uh, end times and what's going to happen at the day of reckoning and things like that. Prior to that, he tells this little story, this parable, and a man who had received one bag of gold. Remember, the master received gold. He picked three people. To one of the servants, he gave five bags of gold. To another servant, he gave two bags of gold. And to the last servant, he gave one bag of gold. And he said, go and, and be fruitful and, and, and work with the money that I've given to you. So as the master goes away, the five and the two, the guys that have five and two, they get together, they commiserate, they do some kind of a deal, there's some trading going on. Whatever the case is, they invest it and it multiplies itself. So that when they see the master, they actually give back more money than the master had originally given to them. But then there was this one man who was given one bag of gold. And because he thought the master was so powerful and was really, was really concerned about his wealth, he said, I'm just going to put it in the ground and make sure nothing happens to it. So that way, when he comes back for it, I can pull it right out of the ground and say, here, I did not lose your money. The man who had received one bag of gold came to the master and he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid with your money and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. So here it is, dusting the dirt off. Here is everything that belonged to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and you knew that I worked hard and I gathered where I did not scatter seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit at least with the bankers. So that, that way you would have a little bit of return, but you give it to me back with no interest. What can we say of the guys that had five bags and two bags? They were expedient. They understood the value of what they held in their hands, and they knew that they could efficiently multiply what they had been given. What can we say about the one who was given one bag? He didn't think about anything he could do with it. He didn't work hard with it. He didn't even try. He was full of excuses. He blamed the master for being so harsh that he was so concerned that he wouldn't do anything with the money. Therefore, that's why he wanted to give it right back to him. And for the longest time, when I would read this passage, I would think, oh, that's because the man didn't know the master. If he knew the master well enough, he would have multiplied the gift. That's not really it. What is at the root of what is going on in this man's life? The one who was given one bag of gold. And what's at the root of this world sometimes and gets slowly pervasive into our world is this idea of indifference. He was indifferent towards the entire endeavor. Didn't care. Didn't care to take the one bag of gold that he received to do something with it. Just neutral. Didn't lose it. Didn't gain anything with it. Further on in Matthew 25, as Jesus really starts talking about the day of reckoning, he said, there's going to be two groups of people to my side. On my left side, there's going to be people. And when I look at them, I'm going to say, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was sick, you helped me. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. 
And they're going to look at the master and say, when did we do that, Lord? I didn't even see that you were ever naked or ever hungry or ever thirsty. He said, no, no, no. Whatever you do for the least of these people on this planet, you've done for me. In other words, go into space with my father. But then there will be those who come to me and I will say, when I was naked, you did not provide any clothes for me. When I was hungry, you did not give me anything to eat. When I was cold and thirsty, you did not give me anything to drink. And they'll look at the Lord and say, what? I never saw you in that space. If I ever saw you be that way, I surely would have done something for you. But Jesus says, no, 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 I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about whatever you do for the least of these in this world. You have done the same thing to me. Therefore, you have no part of me. They would have done it for Jesus if it was Jesus who was naked and poor and hungry and thirsty because that was the object, right? That was who they were looking at. They were indifferent towards everyone else. Indifferent. Didn't care. This indifference, by the way, is the one hamstring for Jesus' ministry. Those that are neutral, those that don't want to engage either for or against are people that Jesus just can't reach. Unfortunately, he cannot. That's why he was so adamant about, listen, either be cold or hot. Let your yes be yes or your no be no. Be on the edges of the spectrum. Because listen, if you don't agree with me, I'll, I'll discourse with you all day long. But if you just stand there neutral, indifferent, I can do nothing for you. I mean, think about it. Jesus spent his entire ministry hanging out with people that disagree with him adamantly. He didn't run from them. And he knew that they were going to be the people that eventually would kill him. He stayed with them. He doesn't run from those that are cold or hot. But he can do nothing with those that are just in neutral. That are indifferent. This idea of whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me, has less to do about feeding hungry people. and has more to do with our understanding of our indifference in this life. If we want to live a beyond Sunday Christian life, we have to move beyond indifference. We have to see needs that are there and actively pursue the meeting of those needs. We have to be aware and concerned and have care for those that are around us and, and wanting to be in that space so that we could do good deeds that God might receive the glory. But if we are indifferent, if we are just soloing, if we're just kind of staying in our corner and not affecting anybody, not making anybody mad and not making anybody happy, not making any waves, then we're not fulfilling the call that Jesus has for us to live beyond Sunday. What I will find most often is Christians who struggle with this beyond Sunday life are very indifferent about most things. Those that are not indifferent are people like Jim and his family. Probably indifference isn't in his vocabulary. Not caring about something. Not seeing the surroundings. And looking for needs and ways to meet those needs. Not a part of his life. I personally just met Jim for the first time 20 minutes ago. I don't know him very well. I'm excited to interview him just because I personally want to get to know him better. But I can tell you this much, Jim. I haven't seen my mom that excited in a long time. Now, she's great. She's excited about my kids. She's excited about everything. But I will say that I couldn't get her to stop talking about how everything went at Kensington. And to me, that's something that's monumental. My mom is no longer indifferent about Kensington. She may have been, not knowingly, right? She didn't say, oh, I don't like people in Kensington. She just didn't know. She didn't have the care for Kensington because she was never able to go do the good deed to glorify God. Now she comes home. It's all she can talk about, right? The indifference is gone. <laughs> and that's what you do and your family does for people every weekend, many, many ministries around this area. So it's a real pleasure for me to have you come on up here and uh, let's, let's talk for a little bit. So we got to welcome Jim Snyder. All right, so I'm only watching the clock, Jim, because uh, we have a discourse group that start in about 20 minutes. So you and I have 20 minutes together. We got food. We got food. There's food. Yeah, we got food. Is there enough uh, space there on that court? All right, so I do know that people here are no stranger to your ministry. Um, and you know, actually, I'm probably the most stranger to your ministry, learning more and more about it every day. 
So I thought what would be cool though is to hear a little bit from, like last weekend Sarah was up here with me. She recently moved from doing full-time careers. She's doing part-time seminary right now. And so we talked a little bit about that, that space of where you make that decision to do that thing, right? And how is that a beyond Sunday type of thing? Could you just start me back at the beginning real quick about like, I, I read a little bit on the website, 1998, you're from uh, Florida, you came up the really cold concrete Kensington, right? Like how did all that stuff go down and what was in that decision making process for you and your family? Well, we only have 20 minutes. So. <laughs> some of you have heard some of my story. Um, I guess it started, I went to Liberty University. Um, so I got a Christian education, but I majored in accounting and um, I was with Young Life, uh, full-time area director down in West Palm Beach, Florida for a little bit, and then became a youth pastor. And it was, I grew up in the church, okay. and my wife was safe through Young Life, so she didn't come from a church home, her family didn't go to church, that kind of thing. So the two of us together was really interesting, because I was like, our kids aren't going to Christian school. It's just terrible. She goes, our kids are going to public school. It's terrible, you know? <laughs> so it's like we both have this different, you know, ideas and impressions. And so, oh. you know, here I am. If you know anything about Young Life, Young Life is very outreach oriented. Yeah. It's working with kids that are, have, they're not on the radar of church at all. Yeah. You know, they're lost kids. And um, you're bringing basically new Christians into the kingdom. It's pretty amazing how it works. And so doing that, and then going back into the church to do uh, youth pastor type work, was um, very frustrating for me. Sure. Because I saw myself sitting there in that chair Sunday morning for Sunday school or whatever for the youth group and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you don't need to hear, you know, Zacchaeus story again. You know, <laughs> you, don't, you can you preach these stories to me. You know? yeah. So what are we yeah. doing, you know? Um, so, uh, the group have been going, we've been going, they've been going to camp for years, you know, summer camp, that's what you do, that's what you sure does, right? You put them on a bus and you go live with kids for a week, you know? And, um, so I canceled that and, you know, this was a big church, uh, so it was a big uproar, we had a parent meeting, you know, this is, <laughs> what are you doing, you know, this is, we've been doing this forever. And so I clearly opened it up to the parents and said, all you gotta do is get on the bus with the kids and the program's all done, you just sleep in the bunk rooms with them and you bring them back home. You don't, you, you don't have to speak, you don't have to preach, you don't have to do nothing. So what parents would like to take the kids and go to camp, right? I mean, I probably had 30 parents in the room, but nobody. I got one lady willing to make cookies for youth group. That was all I got out of that whole baby. Yeah, so, that, so we went on a missions trip. Uh, I said, if I'm gonna give up a week, we're gonna do something that I think will you know, have an opportunity to impact these kids. And it did. I mean, it was a big time. We went to Mexico, um, and it impacted me, obviously, as much as it impacted them. And it was at that point uh, where I, well, it's funny, because I had parents that were just like, um, one mom came up to me, she had two, two twin boys. And she looks at me now and she goes, I'm holding you personally responsible for the safety of my children. In Mexico. Yeah, in Mexico. And this was, you know, there's still sure. bad, you know, drug cartels and all kinds of mess going on. They were kidnapping Americans. It was, we weren't going to a safe place, you know? And I said, you better pray. Because I says only the Holy Spirit can take care of your kids. I can't, you know. <laughs> and, awesome. and she just kind of walked away in disgust, you know. <laughs> but the funny thing was, months later, not weeks later, but months later, like six months later, she came up to me and she says, kids have been in church their whole life. They've gone to camps, they've gone to weekend retreats, you know, music, conferences. And sometimes they'll come back different for a couple of days, you know. And she said, they came back and they're still different. Because they're, they're changed. And it's like, it's like what your mom experienced, you know? Just, and that was just like an hour or so, you know what I mean? Yeah. Imagine what a whole week of doing sure. mission work. Right? And it just changed the life, the dynamic of this youth ministry. And so I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to live in Mexico, I want to host these teams. I mean, this is what's changing the lives of people. I want to do this, you know, full time. And I grew up in church, so I assumed, and part of it was the verse that you shared, the sheep and the goats verse. Yeah. Um, I was a goat. I was indifferent. I was, you know, checked out. I was, you know, you know, I, yeah, I was youth pastor, but what was that? It was no different, you know. We're all sitting in the same building, you know, the same pews. I'm teaching, you're listening, you know. It was no different. And, and it was, you know, so I came to that conclusion, and I'm like, you know, okay, well, I know how to fix it. I'm going to go be a missionary in Mexico. And because um, I have my accounting background, I'm very logical, you know, I have my list, I know, I, I know the plan. We knew people there. We knew a ministry there resources there. We had friends of ours that had gone there. It was just, it was 
same climate as Florida, you know, because it's right just yeah. west. If you take a shot west out of West Palm Beach, you'll run into Mexico. So it made, per made perfect sense. It was totally logical. And so a year goes by, and two years go by, and three years go by, and four years go by, five years go by, and six years go by, <laughs> seven years go by, and I would go to Mexico for like a month and lead these teams. Because um, I wasn't full time, but I would go for a whole month and be like the, the base director for that, for that month. And uh, seventh year summer comes by, and I, the airline tickets like quadrupled. It went from like a couple hundred dollars to like seven or eight hundred dollars round trip, you know. And I just couldn't afford that, you know. So it wasn't. So I was like, all right, Lord, I get it. <laughs> you know, you don't want me to do this thing, you know. And all this time though, I'm still praying that that I'm a go. Like I'm still like, um, I. I I really see our relationship, it's a relationship we have with God, and that's what he desires. He desires this relationship yeah, sure. with us, you know. So I see him as my daddy, so I'm like, Dad, I can't do this. Like, I know I'm a goat, I'm acknowledging I'm a goat, but I don't know how to fix it. I even, we even changed churches. We were going to an inner city church. We were living in the suburbs in West Palm Beach and going to an inner city church that was doing all this stuff. They had ministries on Saturday. They had outreaches in the parks and after church. Homeless people were in church and sitting in church. And I was doing nothing, because I had stuff to do. I had to cut my, you know, I had the weekend to get the lawn done and take care of everything. And, you know, I didn't have time to, to go do these things, you know? So I, I, you know, I was kind of trying to fix it, but I really wasn't trying to fix it, but I totally acknowledged that I was a go. And I just said, Lord, you just gotta fix this, because I don't know, you know, I do my, once it, <laughs> Once a year I go for a month thing, you know, and then he shuts that down and I'm just like, I don't know I don't know what you want from me. You know, I'm just done. I'm not gonna be a missionary I'm gonna stay in West Palm Beach and, and you know do the family suburban thing You know, because my vision of being a missionary because I grew up in church was like this grass hut somewhere with a dirt floor You know, and, you know what I'm saying? There's some tribe and a lot of flies, you know, and that was that's what so I was like I was, I was like, this is a big deal, I'll, you know, and I just assumed that as soon as I said that, God was just going to snatch me up and go, whoa, there you go, here's your grass hut, you know, and it's like, after seven years, I'm just like, I don't get it, I just thought he was so desperate for missionary, I just thought he was so desperate for people to do that, that I, and I was like, I guess not, I guess he didn't really need me, you know, I guess it's not happening, and so obviously I, I gave up that summer, and you know, I'm in Philly, an opportunity for that same mission organization came to do, to lead a trip for one week in Philly. And so I came and I loved the trip that the, the, the guy got sick and so I had to jump in kind of the last minute. And um, so I came up and did that. The, the leader of the organization was kind of like well, the people that are there, which weren't really people, it was like college students, like living in a frat house kind of thing, you know. They said, they're, they're not gonna be there and where the location's at, like you can't leave the house abandoned because it'll become a crack house, you know, the building. So I was like, we, first of all, we need you to run the program and we need somebody to live there, what do you think? And I said, no way. I said, I can't, it's, it was terrible. And he said, pray about it. And I said, no, I'm not going to pray about it. I'm not doing it. You know, the answer is no. So he's done. You know, so he's like, all right, okay, whatever. You know, so then like another three or four weeks go by. And he goes, well, believe this, somebody else got sick again. I need you to go back to Philly and run a trip. He says, this time I want you to take your wife. And I'm like, I know what you're trying to do. And that ain't going to work at all. <laughs> you're going the wrong way. Because when she sees that place, she's going to agree with me 100%. Now, I saw the ministry. I loved it. I love the ministry. I love the people. I love, like you said, talking to them. Like, I've been in Mexico all these years. And I, could, I had to get a translator. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, come on. You know, and then somebody come running up to me. And they, da 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 I'm like, I don't know. I get a translator. <laughs> Some test, you'd have a testimony. Like, she's sharing how awesome this these kids prayed for it, her kids got healed, and all. it poured rain, and for the first time in her whole life, they were up off the ground because we built them the shed of a house that they could live in. And she's just crying with tears, telling how thankful she was. And, and I had to get a translator, all the, you know, I'm just like, I need a translator, she's excited about something, there's a testimony here, somebody tell it to me, you know? And so, it was so great being in Philly, because I just talked to the people, and it was like the same kind of stories, like, the poor and all, just, they just feel hopeless. There's a, the enemy just attacks them all in the same way. Wherever you're at, Mexico, you know, mountains of West Virginia, streets of Philly, you know, the, the enemy just attacks them. They're worthless, you know, they have no value, they have no meaning, there's no hope in life, you know, it's just, just it's like a suck on the life out of them, you know, you just see it wherever you go, you know. So it was so fun just to be able to talk to people and encourage them and to be able to hear their story and automatically respond without a translator and that kind of stuff. So I was, don't get me wrong, I was thrilled about the mission, I was thrilled about the ministry, but I had a wife and two kids. And I just couldn't live in a place where there were needles, they were shooting up right in front of the window, they were doing tricks in the abandoned cars in front of us, the homeless encampment was right out back. 
burning barrels, you know, 24 seven, people were dying all around the building, ODing or getting murdered, you know. I mean, one week there were three people that passed away, you know, within a baseball's throw of the roof. And I'm like, this is no place to live and raise kids. Clearly, no. And Jennifer went with me and agreed too. Clearly, no. <laughs> But I'm still on my face, really broken and on my face because I'm a goat, you know? I'm just, I'm not doing it. I'm a goat. What do I do? I, read, I heard the message. I'm convicted. <laughs> Father, what? How do, how do I fix this, you know? And, and so it was amazing because we think of, you know, growing up in the church, I always thought of missionaries as these, like, superstars, you know? Like, I should tear my shirt open and there's a big S under my chest, or big M for missionary, you know what I mean? <laughs> And, but you read scripture, you read the Bible, and you don't see superheroes in the Bible. You don't see these perfect lives. You don't see this perfect, you know, this perfect person come up. I mean, you see murderers. You see, I mean, there's, there's a guy in there, God, Jesus, God, man ever God's own heart. He killed a man to steal his wife. <laughs> He's, you know, I mean, that's not kind of the person you want to lead your church. You know what I mean? This is not the person you say, well, here's a man after God's own heart, please come, come be pastor. You know? But that's what the Bible's full of. The Bible's full of people that aren't qualified. They're a mess. But what are they? They realize that, and they fall on their face, and they say, I'm going to go. I need you, Daddy, to help me. You know? And, and that's what it is. I wasn't doing it. So, so obviously, I mean, you know, there's a whole long story for me getting on the mission field. And, and as an accountant, I have my list, you know, all this stuff. For seven years, I've been, like, we had debt. We had credit card debt. We had medical debt. Like, I didn't want to go to Mission Field with all this debt. Literally within four months, all that stuff was taken care of. All of it was done. Our house sold for more than it should have sold for. I mean, it sold in a week. You know, it was just, like, crazy, crazy. So when somebody asked me one time, Are you, how do you, like, one guy was funny because, you know, you start support raising at some point in there. I didn't go too well, but anyway, he's like, well, what are your qualifications to be a missionary in the inner city? I'm like, none. I'm like, if I'm alive in a year, you'll know it's a miracle. <laughs> I mean, seriously, this is, this is how I'm going. I'm going like, I, I've never even been to the Northeast. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've been, I went to the, did two missions trips. I'm not from Philly. I'm not from an inner city. I'm from West, have you ever been to West Palm Beach, Florida? It's Polo. I've lived in Wellington. Polo Country Club. You know what I'm saying? This is not, like, you had to drive... 45 minutes to an hour from my house to be able to buy crack on a corner. Like, you couldn't just like walk around the corner and get it. You, it was like a commute, you know? Like, you just didn't, there was no homeless people in my neighborhood. I never saw anybody begging at a grocery store, never at a corner. I don't even, you know, you had to go to the inner city of West Palm Beach to see those people and to minister to those people. So it wasn't like they were in my life. It wasn't like, you know, that was like something that I grew up with. So yeah, it was, it was crazy, right? Going to Philly. <laughs> so, so the decision though to go to Philly I mean, what, what ultimately do you feel pushed you and your wife who were kind of adamantly opposed to the environment to say, we're gone? So that was it. So that, Jennifer had her own story of how God reached her. Because God told me, don't, don't talk to Jennifer about this. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, an angel appeared before me. But I, and I really kind of argued back. I'm like, all right, well, then I don't know how you move your family to inner city Philly without talking with the wife about it. But, but, what, but what that was was is I don't think the Lord wanted it between me and her. He wanted it between me and him, and for her to be between me and God. Okay. So we're both working on a relationship with God separately. Even though we're married, if we're working on our relationship, we're still working on a relationship with God. And so that relationship between Jennifer and God needed to work out, and my relationship with me and God needed to work out. So I was 100% on board with the mission, the ministry, the people, the need. Like I told him, I said, you can't shut this down. This is better than Mexico. Like this is definitely needed. You know, you've got to keep this ministry going, you know, kind of thing in Philly. So I was on board with that. I didn't see how it would work with the family, you know. And then, you know, support raising was nowhere. I mean, I think, you know, like after three months living there, I think we had $400 a month in support committed to us, you know. But luckily the organization was paying for our housing and stuff, so nobody was turning the lights off and we had a place to live. But still, $400 a month, you know, you got car insurance, you know, you got, you got to live, you got to make groceries. You know. And all of that That's was still with this mindset of you're going to be hosting youth trips, right? Yeah, yeah, short-term trips. That was how it started, you know, so in the summer, short-term teams would come and stuff. And that was a hard sell because there wasn't a lot of people that really kind of wanted to do that. <laughs> and that was early on in the boom of that short-term. Oh, that was, a, yeah, that was, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was, you know, over 20 years ago. So, yeah, the area we were in was, was bad. Like, it was safer to go to Mexico than it was to come to a mission trip in Philly. It was at the time. You know, if you asked me, I would say, yeah, go to Mexico. That's, that's a, 
That's a nice trip. Don't come to Philly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, it's, yeah, it, was, it wasn't good. So anyway, I don't know where I was. But so, how did it go from youth training, youth trips to what you're doing right now? So that was so the organization I was with was Short Term Missions, Adventures and Missions, and their goal is to mobilize the church for missions. So it takes people, you know, like you guys that are sitting in a pew, takes you on a mission trip, changes your life, and then you go with another organization and become like a full time missionary. Well, because of the location of where we were at and owning the property there, which is unique, because a lot of times AIM will go and just like let kids sleep on the floor of a church or something like that. So we actually had a building and a facility there. So I'm living with people 24 seven. People are knocking on my door. They're, you know, it's like, there's a lot going on. Like, I, I'm like, I can't just not help people. You know, I had a guy come to the door and, and he had cancer and he wanted some insurance, you know? So it's like, all right, I've got $400 a month. Like, huh? insurance is not cheap. Like, how am I gonna get this guy insured, you know? And so it's like, well, how does that happen? And God provides and da 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 da. And then one time he needed tuna fish, you know? So it's like, I went to our cupboard and got tuna fish. And Jennifer went to make tuna fish. She goes, Where's the tuna fish? Yeah. I'm like, Well, I gave it away. And she says, You need to get your own cupboard. <laughs> so we started our food cupboard, you know? Anything we start, yeah, you need to get your own cupboard, yeah. So we started our own food cupboard. You catch it because there's a food cupboard now, you know? And it's like, so anyway, anything we've done, we've done out of people asking and meeting a need and that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's nothing that I. God sent us to a place, and out of that place, he showed us what we were going to do, you know. And uh, so, at some point, Aim said, you need to, we're not a full-time mission organization. Like, we can't support this, we can't fund this, you know. And so, we're going to have to let you go, <laughs> you know, so you can maybe do your own thing, and we're going to, and so that was a big, huge transition. So that's when we started Cash Your Cares, um, and that's when we saw God, you know, take our support from, you know, four or five hundred a month to, I think, the first year, we raised like $75,000. Uh -huh. Yeah, they covered the building expenses, the mortgage, the utilities, the food we were giving away, like all kinds of cool stuff. Is that a little bit because your mindset, you were detached and you could do the things that you wanted to do? Or like, what's the credit for this like, God. God doing this? I mean, that was the other verse you talked about, God gets the glory. Like I, you know, I, 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 I didn't take any credit for the $400 a month. I don't take any credit for the $75,000 a year. It's God, God gets the glory for that. You know I mean? He totally, has provided for us and taken care of us. I mean, it was $400 a month. We never wanted for anything. We never needed for anything. We had stuff provided for us. I mean, it was, I got this, there's so many stories you might have heard the cupcake story, but my son was having a birthday. And so we were with a co-op group with our homeschool and they were having like a fall party because his birthday's in October. And they're like, well, why don't you bring cupcakes to the party and we'll just celebrate Zachary's birthday at the fall party we're gonna have. You know, so it's like, you know, great. There's a party for Zach. Because we lived, the, the co-op we did was in Morgantown, Pennsylvania. So it was like an hour away. So. We commute out there, and that's where a lot of the friends were. So it was like, a hey, great idea. You know? So then, but we didn't have money. We buy cupcakes. You know, we go to Sam's because it's nice cupcakes at Sam's. And we, we didn't have money to buy cupcakes. You know, so I'm out sweeping the front sidewalk, which is what I would do every day when I first got there, because it'd just be trash everywhere. And so I would get like huge bags of trash every day, and other people would laugh at me. What are you doing this for? Like, I'm cleaning my my front of my buildings are going to be clean. You know, it gave me some. And plus, I'm outside. I'm talking to people. People are walking them by. You know, this God always has assignments for you. And so I'm out there just like mad at God. I'm like, what? I cannot buy my kid cupcakes for birthday. Like, what is this? Why have you brought me here? Have you brought me here to die? You know, this doesn't make any sense at all. Are you really? It was like, I'm at the bottom. I'm getting, you know, we've been there a while and you know, just, it's, it's hard when you're in the city and all you see is concrete and asphalt and pavements. You know, you don't get to see nature. You don't get to see, I mean, I have a garden that God's blessed me with, but at the time it was like a vacant lot with abandoned cars in it, you know? So it's just, it's, you know, it was a hard place, you know? And I'm just, I'm, I was mad, you know? I'm telling him I'm mad. I'm talking to him while I'm sweeping and cleaning and I'm praying. And this lady pulls up, and I remember, it was like a bright yellow Ford. A little one, a little Ford, you know, a little Ford. And she pulls up, she goes on the window, and she goes, are you Jen, Je Jennifer's husband? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I am. You know, she goes, she goes, well, I know your wife, but you know what I mean? And I was just driving around. She was like a, she did some nursing stuff, in home nursing care. And she says, I just felt like God told me to come by and give you some money. And she says, so I'm just, I'm gonna give you all the money I have in my wallet, you know. And it was like 200 and some odd dollars, you know. She's hand, on the street, as I'm sweeping, as I'm hollering at God, <laughs> telling him he's not taking care of me. She pulls up in the car and hands me cash on Kensington Avenue, you know. I mean, it's like, it's, just, it's you know, and that's just one of God's provision. It's like, you talk about finding a coin in a fish's mouth, yeah, whatever. How yeah. about $200? Yeah, how about $200 from a yellow Ford driver? I'm like, I don't even know. When I'm telling God he ain't, he ain't getting it done, you know? He's like, right, I got you. You're, I'm getting it done. You want cupcakes? Here, go get your cupcakes. You know, so I mean, it's just like, it's, you know, I can't. So you ask, how do I know? 
I was afraid not to go to Philly. I was afraid not to, to go there, you know? I was, I was more afraid to stay in West Palm Beach, really. I'd seen God do so much kind of stuff. So, I mean, if you're, I, and I don't think it's like, I, I mean, one of the things that, that scripture is full of stories. I mean, that's what it is. And it's full of stories that are to do what? They're, they're glorifying God, they're honoring God. And that's what we all have. Like, that's what, that's, what, that's what our relationship with God is all about. You know, like sharing these stories of where God showed up and where he gets the glory. Like, there's no way, like, a business, I'm an accountant. I did business plans, I did financials. They didn't work, they were scary. Like, I'm like, this, we, we ain't gonna make it another week. What do we, you know? And so I have my little board, you know, and I go, we need a budget. You, you don't need a budget, they don't work. I've done the budget. It's, the budgets are scary, it's not gonna happen. You know, and yet somehow every year it happens. Somehow every year, the stuff, it's crazy. And I, I mean, I, there is a connection to the poor. There is a blessing associated when you minister to the poor. There just is. My wife, if you give her $100, it'll be gone in a week. She's just going to, it'll be gone. She'll just give it away, you know. And she just, I, and I feel like she just, she's like testing God in that. Like, oh yeah, okay, I'll give it away. Oh, here, now I get $200. Oh, okay, I'm going to give that away too, you know. So she's, she's had, I've never had anybody in front of me with a checkout line where it says decline and they can't pay their grocery bill. She's probably had it happen a dozen times. And she gets to pay it, you know? Because there was a time in our lives when the decline would come up, yeah. you know what I mean? And you know, she said one, or one of her favorite words way back in her testimony was approved. She just, <laughs> she just loves saying approved. Dude. Yeah, approved, yeah. And that's when you're taking notes and you're counting every grocery and you're like, okay, I know there's this much in need counting. How can it be declined? I don't understand, you know? You're like a dollar off in decline, and so and just the and that and that's part of like you don't have to be in Africa in a grass hut, you know, to, to pay somebody's groceries in front of you who got declined. You know what I mean? And, and the, the bless them and just let them know that God loves them. Like, why are you doing this? Uh, God just wants you to know He loves you. You know, it can be just as simple as that. Like you're talking about scattering seeds, and you're talking about not knowing where you're sowing, and you're sowing on ground that doesn't make sense. You know, and, and that's what that's what we're here to do. Like we're just scattering seeds. We don't. We don't need to qualify that. We don't need to go, hey, t let me see your, I mean, I, don't get me wrong. Now, if somebody comes and wants me to help pay their electric bill, I will help them one time. And then after that, I'm like, we need to sit down and have a talk. Like, if you need more help again in the future, like, I need to see your financials, I need to see your income, I need to see expenses. And, and it's simple, just all your receipts, just put them in a paper bag for one whole month and bring in the paper bag. And we'll sit down and we'll, and we'll talk about what's going on here, you know? And I've never had anybody come back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody's ever come back. You know, so I don't know what it is. I'm scared to complain about. But but giving unconditionally, you know, you you yeah. see Jesus doing that a lot of times. Like the feeding of the five thousand. I'm sure there were people there that you know could have packed a lunch and could have provided for themselves and could have done. But no, he's just like whatever. You're here. Let's eat. You know. I mean, how great was that fish and bread? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know. So good. I mean, you talk about the wine, and they were talking about how great the wine was. We never talk about how great that fish and bread was. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's probably perfectly cooked. Best and meal ever. Bread. bread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really good bread. Yeah. They're still talking about it ten years later. Maybe that fish and bread. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So good. So good. Yeah. Jim, I have definitely um, not given you enough time to share your story, and I apologize. Um, we could probably be here for a couple of hours, but um, all giving God the glory. Yeah, man. Uh, in a minute, Michael, I'm going to ask if you'll come up and pray over Cast Your Cares, because we are connected with you in a way of a ministry outpouring of who Yeah, we are. let me say, I know we got time, but you guys are amazing, you're awesome. I mean, I hear this message, and it's like, you guys are doing it, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I go to, I've been to mega churches, <laughs> I'm talking, you know, huge big churches with big smoke, and, <laughs> you know, I'm serious, <laughs> right? And they have less people come to the outreach on Saturday than you guys do. So you, you, your heart is there, and your heart for the poor, your heart for those in need are there. I mean, the food you're bringing, the excess food, I mean, more food than's needed, you know. We weren't short, you know, and so I just want to let you all know how awesome it is, how great you guys are doing, encourage you, and you know. And, and again, if you are feeling like you're a goat, God's got you. All you got to do is just fall on your face and say, I'm a goat, fix me, I'll fix me, and he will. And that's what he did. Back to, I'm just close with this, you know. It, it's not a big M on my shirt. It's a big L for a loser. It really is because I wasn't, I wasn't doing it, okay? So what did he do? So he moved me to the inner city of Philadelphia where people come and ring my doorbell now and say, hey, I'm hungry. Or hey, I need something to drink. Or hey, I need this. Or hey, I need that. And all I got to do is get up from my couch and go to the front door and I get to help them, right? I don't got to schedule a weekend away like you guys do. It's hard to do. I mean, that's a lot. It's awesome. I, when you guys come, like I get them on the couch and I come and greet you at the gate. And it's like, all right, let's do this. You know what I'm saying? 
It's awesome. You guys put in all the work for that. Now, not to say the food cup, not to say it don't work, but you know, I get stuff done. But it's like I'm there. I'm on the site because I was too lazy to live in the suburbs and drive into the city and do it. All right? So that's me. And I don't know what God has for you. I don't think it, it might, probably not inner city filling ministry. Who knows what he's got for you? It could be somebody, your neighbor. It could be somebody in the grocery store in front of you. It's like, that, that's just, you know, you don't have to go to some third world country uh, to be a sheep. And that sets us up for Beyond Sunday because that is what we want. As we go into our discourse groups now, hopefully some of that conversation will be around what is God maybe saying to you as it relates to either what you heard out of Jim's story or do we struggle to be in that space of indifference as it relates to ministering to needs around us. Um, I'm relatively new to this church and so I kept hearing when I first started about this Castor Cares thing and it was just kind of something that was out there and then more and more as I've learned and people watching people step up and take certain aspects of the food and then now Jen's on board and she's coming in she's new to us and she's saying hey I really want to jump into this like God is using not only your ministry to minister to the people that God's called you to but he's also using it to minister to people here in this space. He's told me we're a bridge. He's called me to both. He's called me to you guys, and he's called me to the people. It's awesome. Michael, will you come up and pray for the bridge? That the bridge stays intact, uh, that, that it doesn't lose its footing, and that in, in some sense it's able to be strong enough for everybody to go over. Father, we're just blessed this morning to hear what you're doing and how faithful you are. It's been so good to hear, again, Lord, um, just pictures of, of what you've done in Jim's life over the years what you've done in Kensington, um, just moving, Lord, your spirit moving in him and Jen and their family. And Lord, we're blessed to be um, called into it in, in uh, just different ways. Right? You've, uh, you've given him this ministry of a bridge and through that we have enjoyed many times uh, down in Kensington. We've experienced um, some of what you're doing there. Lord, we pray that you would, uh, you would even this morning, uh, grow that bridge, that uh, we would, in our own lives, see you moving. Lord, would you wake us up by your spirit? Would you take us out of a slumber, out of indifference, and uh, do your work, your, your uh, sanctifying work in us that calls us, Lord, into these places, that we would also share in, in testimony what you're doing, that we would also uh, see you moving. And I just thank you, Lord, that it's practical, it's simple. It's not as complicated as we sometimes make it to be. Uh, forgiveness, repentance, and salvation. And you came to seek and save the lost. Would you uh, take our feet, our hands, Lord, that we submit to you and uh, use them for your glory in this way. Lord, we, we do honor you and glorify you for what you've done. We pray your blessing on Jim and Jen and cast your cares in the, in the season to come, in this season they're in, Lord. Um, for every step, Lord, we just, we, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to hear him this morning. For Willowbrook Bible Church, Lord, would we answer your call in this, uh, this part of life, too? Good. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Thanks, Jim. Thanks. I'll take that for you. Yeah, start there. Um, before I release you to discourse groups, just a couple of quick announcements. Number one, there is an online discourse group today. Jen Klein will have that. So I believe they find the link there, Kim, in the Facebook event page, right? So you can do that. So hopefully if you're online and you want to join, she's ready. Uh, next week, there will be no discourse groups. Our speaker next week is Tony Ruse, the missionary from France. He's flying over today, as a matter of fact, to the States. Um, and he'll be here with his daughter, and they'll, he's going to... He'll be presenting. Uh, we're going to take a break from discourse groups, and we're going to have what I'm calling a family meeting uh, after after our service. It'll be downstairs. Uh, food will follow, I believe. However, it works out with the food. There'll be food present. Um, you know, to do an official congregational meeting is something that I really want us as a church to do, but we're a little too. It's a little preemptory to try to do that right now. So I thought I would just pause and let you know kind of where we are financially as a church, how our ministries that were ramped up, the, the few that we have are, are doing, and you know, give you some updates on the associate search and a couple of really cool opportunities for 2022, 23 that I would like for us as a body to consider. So very casual, uh, there's no, gonna, no voting, no, no board members are, are gonna be doing anything. It's just gonna be me sharing about our church family where we're at. So really hope you'll stick around for that next week um, you know, after service. So. 
All right, you're released. We'll have about five minute break. We'll start discourse groups downstairs at Fresh Grounds if you're sticking around. Jim, uh, and to your wife as well, thank you so much for letting us be a part of your life. And uh, we'll see you next time here in Kensington. All right.